Hi friends, welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I've talked with a guest about how they're using their unique gifts and talents in their specific context and season of life. I hope that you have been encouraged, challenged, and equipped to step out by faith using your particular gifts for God's glory. Dating, engaged, and married couples have lots of conversations to navigate. Sometimes the words budgeting or your parents can start conversations much bigger than expected. Pastor Scott Kadersha knows from 12 years of marriage ministry experience what the important conversations are and how to handle them. He has put his best advice in a new book, Ready or Not, 12 Conversations Every Couple Needs to Have Before Marriage. If you're dating, engaged, or newly married, and you want your relationship to last through the real stuff like finances, in-laws, sex, and kids, then this book is your guide to getting it right. Learn more at scottkadersha.com slash ready. Friends, today I'm wrapping up this season up by faith as I do each time with an Ask Me Anything episode. I've asked my husband, Kyle, to join me in answering your questions, which let me stop right there and say thank you so much for sending the questions in. There were definitely some themes that developed in your questions, so we zeroed in on those, things like church planting, ministry, and parenting. We share how we knew God called us to plant a church, what fears we faced and continue to face, what we would do differently if we could go back and do church planting all over again, and what has most surprised us in the the process of church planting. Then Kyle and I moved into talking about vocational ministry, chatting about everything from how we respond when friends decide to leave our church to how we handle our own theological differences. I certainly hope this encourages all the ministry folks out there. If you aren't in ministry, I still hope you'll listen because I think it will give you a great insight into those who lead and shepherd you. And maybe you'll even want to share this episode with them along with words of appreciation and encouragement. Friends, we weren't able to get to all the questions, uh, specifically about writing, but I'm jumping over onto Instagram stories this week, answering those and any really that you'd like to submit about writing and publishing. Come find me at Christine Hoover 98. Before we get to the episode, there are three things I want you to know as I take a break for the summer on the podcast. One, I would love to hear what you have taken away from this season. Tag me on social media or use the hashtag ByFaithPodcast when you share your favorite episodes or how you've responded to what you've heard so far this season. Second, if you've recently jumped in with me on the podcast, during this summer hiatus, I hope you'll go back and listen to previous seasons. We've heard from some really great guests on things like suffering and ministry and friendship. Third, speaking of friendship, summer is a great time to gather other women and dig deep into the subject of biblical friendship. I want to help you do this. I have put together a six-week Bible study and even a leader guide to help you and your friends talk about this very important subject this summer. You can find all of that on my website, gracecoversme.com, under the Books tab. Just look for Messy Beautiful Friendship, and you'll see everything there on that page that you need. Okay, friends, let's get to the Ask Me Anything episode. Here is my conversation with my husband, Kyle. Hey, guys. It's Christine, and I'm here with my husband, my favorite person in the world, Kyle Hoover. Hi, oh, Kyle. That's nice. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're easy to get, easy to get scheduled. So um, I was, ex- but plus I was excited. I like doing this with you. I like talking with you. So sure. It's fun. Plus I got tons of questions about church planting and ministry and probably because people knew you were, I think I told people you were going to be my person. So that's what they want to talk about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's do this. Okay, let's do it. Well, this season we talked about serving by faith and I wondered what your favorite episode was because you are a faithful listener of the By Faith podcast, which I'm really thankful for. Truly, I am. Yeah, I love it. I listen to everything that comes out, every word you write. I'm I'm a fanboy. <laughs> Well, thank you. What was your favorite episode? Probably my favorite was with Wynn Collier, because I, I know him well as he's a pastor here in town, and yeah. I think what he said about how 
you know, the importance of words and how we use words, especially in this culture that doesn't value them appropriately and use them uses them as arrows to hurt rather than, than opportunities to bless. I think it was very insightful for me as a pastor, as someone who preaches, to think about how I use words. So that was great. Also, obviously, you know, everything Russell Moore says, I enjoy and appreciate how he speaks kind of the gospel to culture and then also Trillia New Bell was I yeah. think was a really good one. Yeah. I loved all of them, but I what sticks out to me is Trillia and Kyle Adelman, who was right after her. They both kind of talked about fear and how we can have the courage to keep going and to persevere. So I really liked those too. Sure. So the whole season's been about serving, which has been kind of ironic. I haven't really said this on the podcast, but it's been kind of ironic for me. I chose the theme a while ago, and this year has been kind of a hard year for me. And I actually shared with my Patreon supporters, I do a secret podcast every uh, season, and I shared with them what has kind of been going on behind the scenes, which if you are listening and you want to hear that and you want to help me make my podcast, I'd be really, really, really honored by that. But this year has been one where I've had a lot of questions myself about serving and where God would have me to serve. So it's been kind of ironic. And one of my Patreon supporters actually asked me more about that. She said, with your role shifting at church, what have you done to go through the transition well? So referring to, I would say, we planted our church 11 years ago almost, and I've been very involved from the very beginning. Happily so, I love to lead and love to partner with you and everything that we do. And a couple years ago, I really felt God leading me to step out of those roles and to kind of release everything. And I thought, okay, I did that. And I thought God would kind of give me a next step pretty quickly after. And he, he didn't and he hasn't. And it's been a time of really a lot of sanctification for me, just waiting on the Lord to show me what he would have me do. And of course I'm doing, I'm kind of jumping in wherever it's needed, but nothing that I feel really like this is where he wants me. Um, so it's been kind of hard cause I think it's touched on a lot of my identity. Like who am I if I'm not doing these things? And so it's been really good, but it's been really hard. So I got the question, what have I done to go through this transition? Well, which I don't think I've gone through it. Well, I think it's been really hard. I've had a lot of tears, a lot of questions, which you know, you've heard them all. Uh, but I think the lifeline for me, and as it is in anything, has been the Word. And just going to the Word every day and remembering who I am as a beloved child of God. It, I'm not loved based upon what I do. God loves me based upon Christ. And what's important to Him is my faith and not what I do for Him. Because I can tend to make achievement and, and performance really um, kind of the priority in my life. So it's been mm-hmm. really good, but it's been hard. And you've been really helpful to me in that. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's certainly hard whenever when we started it with, you know, it was kind of me, you, Bill, and there's a few other folks as well. But as we've grown and as we've, there's just more people that have jumped on the bus. And, you know, what I maybe used to talk to you about, I talked to the elder team about. And, you know, doing things we now have staff paid people for and so i think it's kind of there's which certainly is great. times I'm yeah super glad which about is that. wonderful we've got more people involved serving leading but i think there are times where it's like you've been you felt like you were more on the periphery and i think you i think what's i think what you've said before that your identity is has to be defined by what the word of god says about you for all of us, there's always transition that happens perpetually, that things are always changing for the circumstances in our lives. But I think that as long as there is a pursuit of a nearness and intimacy towards the Lord, then if those things can be stable, if that can be stable, then you can handle circumstances and, and changes well. Yeah. Hopefully that's an encouragement to anybody listening who's kind of like, I don't know what God has for me right now. There have been times where I've thought, God's forgotten me. He's forgotten about me and I'm ready to be used. Here I am. And I have learned that that is not true. Of course, the Lord has reminded me through his word that he, he will never leave me, that he has not forgotten me. And I just have to wait for his 
direction, but he gives me direction each day to love and to serve the people that are right in front of me. And I love we ended the season with Kim Ronselbin talking about living locally, serving right where we are, and that's that's been a huge theme for me too. So we did have one more question based upon the season and then lots of church planning and ministry questions, but someone asked what should what should they do when they feel their plate's too full in ministry? How do they step back from things? I think it's always important to know what kind of your essential intent is. What what you need to be doing that no one else can be doing but you. Yeah. And so draw a circle around that and, and do that really well. Mm-hmm. And so make sure that you know your roles, that you have to carry that out. Spend a good amount of time doing that. And then I think you can know how to hand things off and what to step back from. And But I think if you really know what what your roles are and what you should be about that I mean what what we've talked about for us when you when you have a lot going on that answers automatically no unless it's like absolutely yes yeah you know I think you pray about things but but if you know what you're about and what you should be doing then you have a lot of clarity on how how you need to hand things off yeah I'm the person who tends to get over committed pretty quickly pretty easily and one thing I've learned in the past is that when I know that it's time that God's saying you need to let that thing go, that I give the person in charge of that ministry plenty of notice that I don't just say, okay, well, I'm, I'm quitting, I'm done. But hey, at the end of the school year, I'm going to be stepping out of this. So they have time to replace me and to figure out what, they're, what they want to do. And I've appreciated that too when I've led ministries that people have done that. So I think that's a good rule of thumb, just to give people time to replace if you're a volunteer. We got a lot of church planting questions, and I I love that because I love talking about our church planting journey and uh, hearing what you have to say about it and just getting to encourage church planters. So the first question about church planting is, what were the key factors to influence you to to church plant? Well, I think that there was just this holy unction that we knew that we were supposed to do it. I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience with church planting. I didn't. It was kind of before it was more as common as it is now. Yeah. But I think people started, people that I trusted and valued were like, hey, have you ever thought about this? You might be a good fit. You should pray about it. Guys who had done it. Yes. Yeah. Experienced guys that, that looked at me and were like, we could see that possibly. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you did that someday, then that is possible. And so... That just kind of put it on the radar, so to speak, and it's just something that we began to pray about. We we went to a conference, and we thought it was going to be ten years down the road. It ended up being two years later. Yeah, or even less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Yeah, but I think those are some of the key things. And then we just once we start praying about it, it just never left. Yeah, we felt a very strong compulsion to follow through with first learning about church planting, to praying about the potential that God might be calling us to do that. I just remember even two years before, so Kyle was on staff at a church doing college ministry in Texas, and we loved it. We had a thriving ministry, and we loved what we were doing. We were not looking to leave, but I did feel a sense that something was coming down the road, and this was probably two years before. Something's coming down the road, and God was expanding kind of the horizon of what we were thinking about and and looking at in terms of the church, that we weren't just thinking about our age group that we were ministering to, but we were starting to think about the larger church and and dreaming about what it could be and taking what we had learned at the church we were at and, and taking that to a place where there was more of a need for a gospel-centered church. And so that was something, it was a long process, but God was really, it was a compelling thought that we could not let go of. And through time, we came upon... We didn't know Charlottesville existed. We did not know the University of Virginia existed. Well, you... you did you? you? Did. Yes. I'm well, a sports didn't. fan. We didn't... Did you know Charlottesville? I couldn't have told you where the University of Virginia was, but I could have told you there was there a was university. There was a UK. Well, I didn't know that part. <laughs> but uh, once we... We were... We knew that we wanted to... Once we knew God had called us to church plant, we knew that we wanted to go to a college town, and that's how we started thinking through different college towns, and Kyle, I guess you did mention the University of Virginia. I don't remember. But Charlottesville came up, and we we knew this was the place when we came to visit. So the the, the other part of that question that the, the listener asked was, well, what fears did you have in that time? I think the question 
should be, what fears did I not have? I think there were, there are a thousand <laughs> fears. You know, right. it, it makes me think of Numbers 13 and 14, when the 12 spies go into the land, 10 come back with a report that, that our, our wives and children will be eaten by the people. You know, it's like, man, we will lose our family, that it's going to be horrible for them. Yeah. You know, that it's like, this is scary. The people are giants. We're grasshoppers and slaves. We should just go back to... Just stay what, where what, we are and don't go. go back and be slaves. Make some bricks, you know. And so I think all those kinds of things, I you know, I, I enjoyed my job. I, I was leaving a job not out of discontent, but, mm-hmm. but I knew that I was leaving. And there was a fear of like, have, am I leaving the dream job and everything is lesser? Yeah. I, you know, there's fears of being able to provide for my family. Yeah. There's fears that this is going to be a total disaster and I'm not able, you know, the Lord isn't going to use me. I've heard wrong. This is a disaster in the making. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when we came back from visiting Charlottesville and we were really, it was really kind of the, where the rubber meets the road. You know, are we going to say yes to this or not? And the reality of it, because we could picture it and we could, picture what it meant to uproot our kids and our family and move away. And and I remember sitting in a coffee shop with you in College Station and just saying, is this really, are we really going to do this? Yeah. And the fear was that we, I think there's, there's not this sense of true 100% certainty that God is actually calling us to this. We think he is. But what if we're hearing wrong? What if we were making a huge mistake? Yeah. And and then when we moved here, the fears only got more real because you're looking at you're you are on the ground. Yeah. You see what you're up against and you're with the people now that you've talked yeah. about reaching yeah. hope to reach and, and now they're there. And we were so excited when we landed and landed in Charlottesville and we started inviting people and they're like, Yeah, yeah, we'll be there and no one shows up, you know, and you just think, Oh, this isn't gonna work. So I think my fears were probably a little bit different. I, I, I mean, of course, I thought about finances, but I was fearful that the kid it wouldn't be good for the kids or, you know, what am I going to... I didn't know what it meant to church plan. I didn't know what it meant for me. What does that, what does that look like? And so there are a lot of fears with that. But. And I think there's never... It's, it's not like, oh, we moved past that. And so the fears are all in the rear view. Right. Yeah, there's there's always new ones. No matter where you're at, there's opportunity for fear. Yeah. You know, it's it's now I have to deal with a different set of fears than is this church plant going to make it? Now right. it's a whole different things. I've got a different set of things I have to present to the Lord. Yes. Yes. I think that's a misconception that people have, and I certainly have had it in the past. Is when I'm actually doing what God has called me to do, it's going to feel right, and it's going to feel good and it's not going to be that hard you know and I think it's actually the opposite I think it it does feel right that you're obeying God but it it feels scary every single day that you wake up and you continue on in something where there's not certainty right that's what it looks like yeah what if there's just not contentment in your soul with who you are in the Lord and with him then then it's just going to be this Perpetual striving. Whatever it is, it's never going to be enough. And so you're thinking, if I just get to this point, whatever that, however you define that, then it'll be better. And it's never. It never. It never gets. Stops. Yes, it never gets there. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about those first few months. Because somebody asked, uh, my husband and I are moving to start a church plant. Any tips for those first few months? I think the first thing is I, I would, I would never, I wouldn't do it alone. Yeah. I would make sure that I planted with a team, like a partners, relationships, friendships. Like we, you and I moved up here, but, but we moved up here with a group of people, you know, a college buddy from, that I'd known for 20 years, longer than I'd known you and some other folks who were involved in our ministry. And so I just think the idea of being, you know, a true parachute drop into a new place, that is a challenging situation. So I think that's, one thing. So try to do it with team is what you're saying because yes. Bill is the pastor that came up with us. He's still here. Uh, he's one of our pastor elders. And what I saw from my perspective was that you guys would go out in, in a pair and knock on doors and you do things as a pair. And when you were discouraged, Bill would 
be there to encourage. And when Bill was discouraged, you were there to encourage. And it's like, we can't give up because we have each other rooting the other on, right? It's amazing how there was never a time that both of us were down, Mm -hmm. ready to pack it up. When one of us was down, the other one would be Mm -hmm. ready to charge. And I think that was from the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that is super important that I wish I had taken more seriously, if I could go back and do it again, I would do this, is to immediately try to get to know other pastors and their wives in the community and to ask them questions and to learn from them because they've they've lived here, they know the community, they know they know the ins and outs, they know the things that you can't know right away, right? And so what did they learn if they church planted? And just having a team mindset, I think that could have helped serve us better. I think we figured that out a little bit later and it has served us well. There have been churches here who have been so helpful to us, and now we've gotten to turn around and do that for other people. But I think I would that is the top of the list for anybody going to plan a church is to not think that you are the first one there in the community doing gospel work. Connect with those who have already been there before you and serve with them. And I think that's hard because a lot of times when you move to a new area or to start a church, you're, you're, you're just thinking about, Planting and building that church yeah. rather than God's kingdom people all over that town. Right. That that feels like sideway energy. and But really that's an important part of it where where those who are supportive of you and can they can they can be an encouragement to you they can resource you yes. they can give you they can give you a better understanding of the town and its history and what are the unwritten things about the town that are really important and and being someone who who moved to the town not knowing anything and then having years later new planters come i've seen it done well and poorly yeah and the and the ones who reach out you know we're always like what can we do to help you like we want to see people reach with the gospel in our town no matter what and so i think that there's opportunities to build relationships and friendships with other yes. with other churches and pastors and yeah. wives yeah and I think another just piece of advice is to study your town, study your city. What makes it tick? What are its priorities? What are the, what do the people love? What are they talking about? And try to go where the people are. Where are they gathering? And where do people kind of meet up? And try to be a part of that. So Carl mentioned joining the PTO or joining the HOA in our neighborhood. Those are all things we did join the gym or, you know, go, go where the community gathers and be a part, try to learn how to become a part of the fabric of the community. Yeah. I think just, it's going to take a long time to get to know a place well. And as much as you can become an insider is the better off you will be. Yeah. And just to think like an insider, because for me, I thought like an outsider for so long, that wasn't helpful. I would constantly compare it to where we moved from, you know, even the way the streets are and the way that they change names a jillion times and it's not a grid. Like that drove me crazy because I moved from a place where everything was a grid and it was easy. And so I would constantly compare the differences and I realized at some point that's not helpful for me. I need to think about and embrace the things that are embraceable about the community as far as like it aligns with my biblical understanding embrace that and participate in it and and jump into that and that that's going to help me to kind of make myself at home here and and build relationships Mm -hmm. so I had a question from a church planter so he said what are some things I need to do for my wife and my family in those first few months I think it would be good to think through ask the question what would it look like to thrive in whatever town you're you're living in And so whatever that looks like, so imagine what life would be like at year 10 in this new town where the the church is up and running, good things have happened, you know, it may not be the greatest church ever, but it's a normal church or the worst church ever. (laughs) (laughs) And what would life look like then? And then build backwards and live that way now, like do what year 10 would look like. In, for day one. So mm-hmm. think through what what thriving and abundance looks like and then just do that from the get-go. Because I think a lot of times we always have this, again, we have this vista out there that's like, once I get there, then I will 
be able to slow down or have the time and and that is the world of delusion. Mm -hmm. and, we were actually told that. We were actually told, give it your all for the first three years, sacrifice everything, and we we took that to heart, and we did that. And it was not a good thing. No. So I think what you're saying is, how do you start year one pacing yourself for a marathon rather than a sprint? So we tried to sprint. We tried to sprint for three years, and we fell flat on our faces at the end of those three years because we had lost any ability to return to normal. See, we thought, oh, we'll just go back to some sort of normal pace after that. But we did not even remember what normal was. Like, we had retrained ourselves so much to live at this sprinting pace and to do ministry at this sprinting pace that we were exhausted, we were struggling in our marriage, and we were we were just totally spent because we had not paced ourselves. And so give some examples maybe of some things we decided we needed to change at that point that you wish we had started from year one. I think one is, I've talked about this a thousand times with different people, but the idea of the Sabbath is is a gift from God, a, 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 something he bestows on us and for us to embrace. And when we were little and our kids were little, it was like a micro Sabbath. You know, we did what we could. But the idea of that God builds in for us to rest, like that is a part of his will and good purposes for us, is to, is to not work one day. Yes. Intentionally not work. And so that frees you up to enjoy a husband and wife and children. And so that's a big part of it. I think you always have to deal with your relationship with technology. Yeah. And your cell phone and what role that ought to play when you are home. Mm -hmm. um, I think you thinking through how to be strategic with your calendar as far as building in times together as a family, weekends as a family, making sure that that your priorities go for your family and your spouse before ministry fills up your calendar. Yes, so planning that in advance of planning the church calendar was something we had to learn to do. I think what helped us was to begin to think holistically about ourselves as people, that as a person we're emotional, physical, spiritual, relational, so are we living in each of those components? Are we physically healthy? Are we active, taking care of ourselves? Are we in relationships that are friendships and not just ministry relationships? Are we resting physically? Are we connecting with each other as husband and wife emotionally and not just talking about the church all the time? And all of those things we were not doing well in. Probably, I think friendship was probably we're doing pretty well in, but the rest of it, I would say we were really living as very, um, in one component, which was church. Yeah. I think another thing too is I, I think a lot of church planters, these guys can view their wives as a fill in stop gap for different kinds of ministries that maybe they aren't passionate about or gifted at, but they love their husbands. They want things to work. Like I think I, I talk to a lot of guys who, their wives are doing, you know, back with the kids in some yeah. basement or upstairs room, tucked away from things. And I, I'm, my first question is like, is she passionate about that or is she taking one for the team? And I'm like, man, if she has taken one for the team, you're walking down a, a, a bad road. Yeah. I, do you, I mean, I would say sometimes you have to do what you have to do, but make it a temporary. Are yes. you, what are you doing, husband, to work toward quickly? getting your wife out of that situation. Yeah. And if you're not doing things quickly to help her thrive, then she's going to be in a, a dark place Yeah, soon. Yeah. So one of the best things that Kyle did for me was that as much as I wanted a job description, as much as I wanted to know exactly what it meant to be a church planner's wife, he didn't give me that. He said, I want you to be a Christian. I want you to be a disciple. I want you to be a wife and a mom. And then... Over time, you'll you'll God will show you how He wants to use you in this in this ministry, and it was true. It was just hard for me because I wanted to know what to do, and it took me a long time to kind of figure out my role. And I think that's very common for church planners' wives. It, it takes them a long time to kind of figure out where they fit. It's easy for the planner; he's going to preach. He's going to. It's like specific things already mapped out for him, but for the wife, it's much more 
nebulous. And so um, I would say to the church planters, ha- be willing to have those conversations to help your wife over the first few years process how has God gifted her? How would he want to use her? And like Kyle said, don't pigeonhole her into something just because that is a need that you need to fill immediately. So, yeah. If, if, if your wife is struggling, then that needs to become a priority on your agenda list to talk through that. If she's having a hard time in her relationship with the church, then that needs to go on your to-do list. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that's hard for church planters because they know that their wife is following this call. Some of them, it's like, yeah, I want to support you. Some of them feel very equally called, but they, the husbands feel responsible for their wife's well-being, which is good. But sometimes it can be hard for them to hear how much she's struggling and, and discouraged. And I would say, husbands, as much as you can, be willing to listen to those things, but also speak truth to her. And Kyle did that for me. He spoke truth to me to remind me, God called us here. When I was ready to quit, he said, God called you. He called me. Together, we're called to be here. And he reminded me of God's character. And so, you don't want to rescue her from difficulty because this is how God's going to grow her, but you also just need to be willing to have just really good conversation and communication about how this is all affecting her, and that's going to go a long way to help her. So just a few really kind of popcorn questions about church planting that we got. One was, did we face any discouragement from friends and family when they found out we were going to leave to go church plant, and how did we handle that? I don't think it was outright discouragement i think there was just look looks of puzzlement and <laughs> fear on their faces Concern, like, yeah i mean they uh, had our family had no frame of reference for church planting whatsoever so we had to explain to them what in, what we were going to go do and then i think they had the normal you know we're taking grandkids far away or worried about our you know do we know what in the world we're doing which and, the answer was no we didn't yeah and so i think those we we faced those. But but overall they were we did not face discouragement. No. They were supportive, even though they didn't fully understand totally what we were doing. Everyone was a champ for it. I I think when it comes to discouragement, I I think the the challenge I would have is, is for you to process that discouragement. So if someone comes to you with dis or you feel like you're get receiving discouragement, you need to ask why. So you need to ask is this just because of those things, like, oh, they're taking grandbabies, or they don't want you to move, or it's it's kind of their issues yeah. that they need to work through on their own, and they're maybe projecting those things on you, or is it because they see valid concerns about what you're doing, whether you, you're the you're the people to go and do that, yeah. or if this is whatever it might be. I think it's always good to be like, okay, well, let's do an autopsy on that discouragement and find out what happened and why. Yeah. Because it could be, that could be it a could gift. could be valid. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it common for church planning wives to have to work full time? I would say um, a lot of church planning wives do work full time, especially if they're moving to big cities where the cost of living is high. Uh, I actually did an interview this season with Anna Perez. Her and her husband, Rich, have planted in New York City, and she works full-time, and we did talk some about that. So if you want to know more about that, you can go back and listen to that episode. But I would say, yes, a lot of wives work full-time. Uh, what's been the most surprising thing about church planting? Well, that's kind of <laughs> redundant. <laughs> Everything about church planting is surprising. Yeah, um, the- that's true. What you ever think it might be and what it is or whatever it is, those, those there will be a gap there. Like I recently looked back at our original proposal prospectus that we put forth. Uh, I looked at it a few years back compared to what it was when we, I wrote it. And our church is nothing like what I wrote down and imagined <laughs> originally. So you just don't know what's going to happen. But I will say that I think I'm a little bit more surprised with how the highs are high and the lows are lows. Yeah. Like when you when you get discouraged, it's you get profoundly discouraged. Yeah. And when wonderful things happen, you just are overwhelmingly joyful. Yeah. You know, working at a mega church where where I was before, where you know a bunch of people got saved and baptized, you're kind of like, okay, that 
super. You know, I'm happy. It's normal, yeah. yeah. But now it's like, man, when one person, two, it's it's this monumental thing yeah. that is a joyful experience when you see even just anything of like the Lord's doing. It's yeah. really great. There's so many things that surprise me about church planting, and a lot of them are positive. I would say one of the hardest ones that's surprising is I thought that very first yes to God when we said, yes, we'll go, we'll follow your call, we'll obey. I thought that was going to be the hardest yes. Like once we cross that barrier, it's just not that it was going to be easy, but I would say the hardest yeses came after that. It was a year, year two, year three, year four. I mean, still. To, to wake up and say, am I going to continue to engage fully? Am I going to continue to build relationships? Am I going to continue to work at this and persevere? That, that's church planting and really anything we do by faith. It requires us every single day to say a new yes to God. And that surprised me that the harder yeses were later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's... Because I think you're saying yes to things that you know more about, like it's more tangible, where before it's like, yes, and you have no idea what you're saying yes to. It's, just, <laughs> it's this adventure. Yeah. But you saying yes to what you know about is saying yes to something that's oftentimes nitty and gritty. Yeah. I think I also was surprised how long, I mean, I still feel like we're not church planning anymore. But I think I thought that we would, as you said earlier, we would get to some threshold and it would feel like more, I mean, I hate to use the word coasting. It's not like I would want to be coasting, but kind of that feeling of just, okay, we've arrived, we've made it. And I do feel like we have, we've crossed from being a church plant to being an established church, but there's no coasting. No. <laughs> it's, it, it just feels like more responsibility. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I look at the elders and our staff and all these people and I'm, it's overwhelming to think through of like of leading them and shepherding all these people well as this mm -hmm. church is growing and being established. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I just thought of there was a moment. This is so weird to say, but about year two, I remember sitting on the couch one day and it just hit me. Oh, my gosh, I am a pastor's wife. Like I'd always been thinking church planning, church planning, church planning and getting this thing going, and it just hit me like the goal is to establish a church, meaning my husband's a pastor. He's the lead pastor. That makes me the pastor's wife. And it was kind of this weird feeling of like, I mean, I we've been in ministry since we got married, but I don't know why that struck me so much. It just kind of surprised me. Like the end of church planting is a church yeah. where – you are leading and pastoring, not me, but you leading and pastoring. So uh, that kind of struck me and the surprised church, me. Yeah, That's, the church planner turns into a pastor, right? And so with, you know, with those that with the wife as well. And I think that it hits me strange as well at times. Like at church, I'll be there, like, oh yeah, I'm the lead pastor yeah. here. <laughs> Everybody's waiting for me to you know lead this thing. And then they'll you know I'll be walking down the hall and someone will just be staring at me <laughs> I'm like what are they staring oh they're like oh yeah I'm the they're pastor. like trying to figure this guy out yeah. that they see up up there yeah so it's fun. so would you do this all over again go back to that coffee shop in college station and totally I would do it do I want to do it again and would I do it all over again those are two different right, questions but, but I yeah I would I wouldn't trade these last 11 years or anything mm -hmm. they've been like i said high highs and lows low, low lows but there have been so much blessing and joy for me for my family uh, we've seen the lord do some incredible things i wouldn't trade it yeah i would absolutely do it again i would absolutely do it again as well it's been the hardest thing one of the hardest things i've ever done but it has been it is up there as one of the best experiences of my life i would totally do it again Amen. So here we are. We're now 11 years in. We're an established church. And that's a whole different set of questions that people are asking. And so maybe could you kind of give us a little picture of where we are as a church? You've mentioned elders. We've added some staff recently. Where would you say we are? Well, we're 11 years old. 
So I, it, I like to think <laughs> of it as we're an 11 year old. So there's a lot of things that we can do independently. Mm-hmm. And, but are we, do we have a lot of maturity? Do we have a lot of capability? <laughs> you know, I think it's, so, so it's, we're stable, but there's, there's a lot of growth that still needs to happen for mm-hmm. us. But I think that where we're at with the people that we have on the leadership team, I, I love dearly. Yeah. And I'm thankful for me them. Me too. And just the people in our church are amazing. I'm, I am amazed and thankful to God many, many times when I stop and think about it, just who he has brought to us, what we've seen in their lives, how they serve one another and love our community. We just have great people. Yeah, I I just, I wouldn't want to, if I wasn't the pastor, I would still want to go to our church. And I think there's a lot of pastors that, that would not, that don't say that. Yeah. And I think that they, they say things like, well, sheep bite, you know, as them being the shepherds and, you know, they get hurt and wounded. And, and I understand that, that you do get hurt and wounded, but I don't, that has not been my experience at all, like. The sheep for this shepherd have been a huge blessing yeah. for me, and I'm thankful. Well, and that's not to say there haven't been hard. I mean, totally. Definitely, there have been hard things. And one of the things that someone asked is a hard thing. They said, How do you handle when longtime friends decide to leave the church? That's been a hurt. That's been a hard thing that we've encountered. So, how, help, how do you think through that? Because I feel like you helped me think through, through that pretty well. Well, I think it's just there's grief. So I think what's absolutely there, that is, it's the loss of something. It's it's because you're not going to stay friends with them to the degree that you were when you saw them at least once a week. Yeah, you and know, shared not. and shared a common experience and a common ministry together. I think that's you lose that. Yeah. So, so I think there's a part of that that you just have to own up to. You know, so I think just walking through a grieving process that you're probably not going to be as close to these people as you used to be. And I think that's, if there's things to work through with that, you got to work through that, obviously. But I think if you can separate, I think a lot of times people in ministry can't separate their personal relationships from the fact that other people, they may need to leave for different reasons. That there's times and seasons to be at a church and then there's times and seasons to leave. And it, and it doesn't have to reflect on who you are and the friendship, even though that's super hard. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure people are listening like, well, how do you separate that? You can't truly fully separate it. But I think thinking along those lines, like for me, I think along the lines of as I'm grieving, as I'm hurting, as I'm working through that, I'm thinking of the larger church, the larger big C church that could God actually call someone somewhere else for his good purposes in their life. Absolutely. Right. So who am I to say they have to be at our church just because we have had this relationship? Again, that's really hard, but that's something I, th- I have to think to myself. God may be calling them somewhere else for a good reason. Yeah. And sometimes it may be good for us too. And we just don't know it. It may be a protection of some sort. It, who knows? But to think along that line helps me a lot. And I also try to always, I want to have a conversation with, with the people. And that's that's where it gets hard because people sometimes ghost. You know, they just sneak out the back door. You never, where, everyone's like, where's so-and-so? That's when it's hard. Yeah. that's And that's what I talk to people who leave all the time about. Like, I always talk to folks who leave I, I you know I thank them for how they've left or I'm like hey this has been hurtful and this is you've made things harder than what they need to be and so I, I just walk through different things with different folks of like affirming and thanking them for how they have honored the Lord and treated his bride by how they've left and there's times I've been like man that's been hurtful like yeah. that's been unnecessarily hurtful yeah. and if you ever feel called to leave another church again, here's what I would recommend you do. Yeah. And then just having that honest conversation where it's, how do, how do we leave brothers and sisters and treat them as if they're brothers and sisters and not just these, you know, disembodied, dissold people? Or just something to consume. That yeah. We're not, 
yes, my husband represents this church, but the church is not something meant to be consumed. We're people and we're your family. And so, yeah, as you said, treat us that way. So if you're listening and you are thinking about leaving your church, I, I think it should not come as a surprise to your pastors and elders when you do leave, meaning you should have those conversations. And I think it's my perception that people think they're sparing our feelings when they don't have these conversations and they just leave. But in reality, it's actually the opposite. When you have a direct conversation and you're able to express love to one another and a blessing as they go and a blessing as you depart um, from being a church family together, then I think that is so much better. It means when I see you in town, there's no awkwardness. And I can, and I, as the pastor's wife, I love to have the opportunity to bless that person and say, as you go, I really, my hope and prayer for you is that God will, you will thrive and and wherever you go, that you'll be committed and you will thrive there and God will bless you there. And that's, that helps me to be able to say that out loud to them. And I may not always feel it yet fully, but that's my hope. I want to get to that point where I can really mean that. Yeah, that's great. Another question we got was, as a pastor's wife, how do you and your husband deal with and discuss theological differences? I don't think we have that many differences (laughs) theologically. We probably differ very slightly on things that are more open-handed, secondary issues. But we do have a lot of theological discussions. Sure, and I think that's normal, right, and good, and that we should be talking about things of theological nature. You know, not not be theology nerds, but when we want to talk about like, okay, what do we believe about this, and why do we believe that? Like, you know, kind of this hot button issue lately about complementarity. You know, and I think there's this understanding: whoever you put in in the role as primary leader of a church, they're going to have different perspectives than anyone else. Like on our elder board, we all have different thoughts on some some different things that. The main things we are in full agreement and alignment. Those are their close. On the priority issues, yeah. the gospel is like what is the gospel, right? You you have to believe this to to be linked together right. in spiritual leadership yeah. and oversight of a church. Mm-hmm. And then there's other things where you're like we we can ad- agree to disagree, and we'll we'll do that with charity and unity in in mind for the church. Mm-hmm. And I think. So you're going to do that on all levels of relationships. And so I think that you think through even on the family level as a husband and wife. What are the things that you talk about and you work through? And you talk through with with kindness yeah. to each other. Yeah. I think two things I've learned in this is, one, I have a lot of influence on you. And and that that's good. I mean, God has called me as your wife to be your, yeah. your helper. And a lot of these discussions can be that. They can influence you in the practical outworking of how this plays out in our church. And, and that can be good and that can also be bad. And I've had to learn how to kind of be careful about not pressing you on my preferences. You know my preferences. I but, do. But to not <laughs> push them on you and say... You know, I, you need to go talk to the elders about this. You need to do that. You need to do this. But just, like, trusting God that he is leading you. And he's leading the elders. And these are men that I love and respect. And and they may think differently than me on some things. And that's another point that God's worked on me is trusting. I do trust them. But submitting to them, even in things that I might disagree slightly. It's not that I disagree with them on huge things, but just... Yeah. You know, I would love to see this fill in the blank and being careful about how I say that to you and knowing when to say. And sometimes I am very strong in what I say to you. But then also just trusting God. He's the head of the church and he will lead these men. Right. And I think that's, you know, Ephesians 5, wives submit to husbands. But that only comes after it says we're all to submit one to another. And so me, even me as the lead pastor, one of many elders i i submit to them we all submit to one another for the sake of how we understand the gospel can best go forth within our church yeah into our city and that so we all have to give some on that Mm -hmm. and i think knowing what to what to what to give and how to give and 
the heart behind it is very important. Mm-hmm. So we had a question about kids, raising kids while in the ministry. So what is your best advice on how you can help your children love ministry? And also we had questions about expectations on our boys. Do you ever struggle with that? So we, I don't feel like we, I don't feel like our boys feel a lot of pressure. There's never been a time where we've gone to them and said, hey, you're the pastor of kids, so make sure that you do this or you fall in line that way or act. We've never put a, this grid of expectation on them. Well, this is what pastor kids do. Yeah. I'm not saying others haven't. But we've never done that. I don't... Well, when we've asked them about it, they've never said that anybody's made them feel... Yeah. Say anything like that. Maybe this year, one kid, they had a friend at school who said something like, well, your dad's a pastor. You should... Of course, you know this, right. like, Bible stuff. So, that's really the only thing. But from our church, our church is a very casual... I mean, we meet in a gym. Yeah. So, I feel like some... It take, like, there's not a lot of tradition that... I think sometimes maybe that can come from like a more traditional thing. And I just don't really feel a lot of pressure for my kids to fill some sort of image. I want them to behave and I want them to be wise and to be loving and have good character because that's what I would expect no matter what. Well, I think we also try to encourage them to serve. Not not for the sake of that they're pastor's kids, but that's what... This is what church... This is, Anyone I'm discipling, I talk to them about what serving and using their gifts looks like. Yeah. And so this is, that is a part of our role as parents. And you do a really good job of talking with them about that. Of like, what does it look like to be a a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ in the local church? And how do we live that out? How do we live out community life well? Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what, those are our expectations Mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, I mean, how I think we've helped them, I think they have a love for our church, and they have a love for the people, and they love what you do. Yeah. I don't think, I think they have a positive, I mean, ask us again, maybe in five years, they're 16, 13, and 11. I think they have a positive perspective on things. Um, I think some of the best things that, that have come out of church planning for our kids is one, a lot of our ministry has happened in our home. And so people come in and out. They meet so many different people, and they are so amazing. You know, I mean, like missionaries and um, just people in our church who have amazing stories are doing amazing things in our community, and our kids get to hear that. Yeah. And I think they, they, that's been a really, really great thing. When our oldest son, he was struggling for a while with things. And then I brought him to the men's retreat. Mm -hmm. He has not struggled for one day after that. That was a transformative moment where men in our church connected to him. He connected to them as well. And he loved it. Uh He was so upset that we only do it one time a year. (laughs) And then the middle son, you know, he came back from El Salvador and he was a changed person. Yeah. And our relationship was changed. Like, We're at a great place. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, so I think just taking them along with what you do and explaining the why of what you do. Like, I was thinking just now about there was a family in our church who lost a a child. And my kids went along with me to help kind of pack up some some stuff that when she was ready to pack up some stuff in her house she didn't want to have to deal with. Yeah. deal with it and so my kids went with me uh it was during the summer and they were out of school and we they just helped do all that and so I I could explain to them this is what's happened and this is the honor that we have to be a part of this and that this is what church does this is what it means to love one another within the church so if you have somebody in your life who something hard happens you don't have to be afraid you don't have to run away but you can go and help in that situation and so I think just explaining the whys of what we do and that we would, this is, we don't ever, we're never saying like, this, we do this because your dad's the pastor or I'm the pastor's wife. We have to do these things. It's like, no, this is, this is is what we do as Christians. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think using that kind of language helps, but also I think there've been times where I have said no to things because I know 
our kids are at an age where we can't drag them with us everywhere we go. And I think that that's hard for me sometimes. I don't like saying no. I want to say yes. So like an invitation to go to somebody's house we don't know that's new or whatever. And I know that that would be something that is an expectation on our kids that it would be because they are the pastor's kid. And there, and of course there are times where we, we might offer something different, like just you and I. But I think sometimes relieving some of those expectations helps kids too. Yeah, for sure. So last question that someone asked, and it was about, they, they are saying they have pastor's wives in their small group. And they want to love them well without small group being an extension of their husband's job. I, first of all, I love that question. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that question because I don't, I don't know that many people, I mean, maybe they do and they just don't know what to do, but what a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad you love it. Okay. How would you answer that question as the pastor? You're going to make me answer yeah. that? Yeah. Okay, so here would be my best guess. Is I think if you could treat the wife as her own person and not just not an extension of the church. So if you could ask her questions, try to relate to her about who she is as a person disconnected from church ministry, I think that would be a good starting point. And then two, I would also not 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 Put it on her to be the church answer person for different questions, or how do I sign up for this, or what does that look? You what know, time does this start on Wednesday? Yes, because then that immediately puts the pastor's wife on the back foot of like, okay, you perceive me basically as a staff person or a church answer person, rather than just a potential friend or someone I can I can relate with on a on a personal level yeah I think that's really thank you that's great sure I don't think um I'll speak for myself when this happens I do not like let's say I'm going into a small group and someone kind of like well what do you think about this bible passage because you're the pastor's wife and you would know or to the pastor saying that I don't it's not that I think anybody has ill intentions but I automatically kind of it's not even that I do it intentionally, but it's like, okay, that's this relationship is a ministry relationship. But if somebody is interested in me as a person and my work or what's going on in my life apart from the church, that is an invitation for me to begin a friendship. And so if you want to serve the pastor's wives in your community group or your Sunday school class or just in your interactions with her or with your pastor to show interest in them as just a person is kind of rare and it's an invitation for them to be themselves and it's it's an invitation to begin more of a friendship type relationship versus a ministry relationship. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, well, we had some more questions about writing, but I am going to jump over on my Instagram stories uh, today and this week and answer your questions about writing. So if you're interested in writing or you have questions about that and you didn't ask them already, feel free to find me on my Instagram stories. It's at Christine Hoover 98 and I will be answering writing questions and we are wrapping up this season, but we're going to start a brand new season in September and that season drum roll please, <laughs> is going, thank you, you're, you're really welcome. good at that actually, <laughs> is uh, stories of faith. And so we're going to take our cues from Hebrews 11 and 12, where we want to be surrounded with a cloud of witnesses. And of course, Hebrews 11 speaks about Bible characters. Um, but I'm going to talk to some people in real life now who are living stories of faith so that we can be encouraged. So these are just going to be stories that will encourage you and remind you that walking by faith is so worth it because we're following after Jesus. So join me in September for a brand new season. I cannot wait. I am so excited to begin those interviews soon and to share those with you. So thank you so much for listening to the By Faith podcast this season. It's just really fun for me to get to do this. And I love having these conversations and I love getting to share them with you. So yeah, you know what? I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear 
what you have gotten out of the season. What have you done in response to listening to it? What were your favorite episodes? Come find me on Instagram and, and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Friends, thanks so much for a great season of By Faith. I especially want to thank my wonderful Patreon supporters who have made this season possible so that you might be encouraged. They not only get the inside scoop on what's happening behind the scenes with me and my writing and my podcasting, but they offer me great advice as I make decisions regarding this podcast. So thank you, Patreon supporters. If you want to help me continue making by faith and join this great group of ladies, look for the link in the show notes or look for me at patreon.com slash Christine Hoover creates. Okay, friends, I'm signing off until September. And until then, you know what to do. Keep walking forward by faith.